welcome to the QFF Business Hour, where we discuss farm business issues. You can join us on the last Wednesday of each month at 4pm to engage with industry and professional business advisors to assist you in building your strategic management capacity to prepare for and manage business and climate risks, as well as improve economic, environmental and social resilience. I'm Sally Williams, and I wish to begin today's episode by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waters throughout Australia and pay respects to elders past, present and future. This session is made possible through the Future Drought Fund Farm Business Resilience Program, a jointly funded program by the Australian Government and the Queensland Drought and Climate Adaptation Program. In this episode of the QFF, Farm Business Hour, we will discuss the crucial response phase after a natural disaster event and what you might need to think about beforehand to prepare for impact. Now, I would now like to invite and introduce our wonderful panellists. First of all, we have Lisa Beach, Acting Director, Natural Disaster Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. And Lisa's been on the front line this month helping to coordinate the response for agriculture impacted by the Northwest Queensland floods. Hello to you, Lisa, welcome good aboard. Afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon to you, Sally. That's thank really great to have you here. Oh, look, it's really, and thank you, because you're a very, very busy lady, and we're very, very grateful to have you with us today. And Barry Naylor, Principal Queensland and Northern New South Wales Green Life Industry Australia. Hi, Barry. Hi, Sally, and um, hi to everyone. Glad to be here. Yeah, well, we're really happy to be um, to be talking to you today and listening to you today, which is more important because I know you're going to bring a lot of value to this discussion. And also our final panellist, it's really great to have Kerry Battersby, Project Manager, Queensland Farmers Federation, with us. Kerry, hi, Kerry. Thanks, Sally. Really good to be here. Obviously, QFF has a lot to do with Lisa and her team at DAF. And... Mm. Um, I've had years of experience working with Barry at uh, NGIQ for the nursery industry and um, his experience in terms of being an extension officer, but also a um, industry recovery and resilience officer. It's fabulous to have yeah. them both with us today. Okay, but before we do start, I would like to just start with our intro and the scale and impact of Queensland's weather events make it the most natural disaster prone state in Australia. And we've seen again this month the northern western northwest of Queensland impacted by floodwaters with damage assessments continuing to come in. Yet Queenslanders and Queensland's agricultural sector have developed a predisposition for resilience, born from years of experience and capacity to adapt to changing circumstances and recovery from disasters. Many Queensland agricultural businesses have repeatedly experienced the cycles of recovery, with more than 50 disaster events since. 2011 impacting the state. That's a lot, 50 in what's that about 12 years or 13 years. Recovery can be a complex and at times lengthy process with different sectors recovering at different rates. Today's panelists are experts in understanding the importance of the initial response phase of a disaster, mainly the first 36 hours post event. Early preparation for a possible incident can streamline and simplify the response phase, especially in the immediate two to three days after the event. And although farmers are inherently resilient, this resilience or ability to recover and attain full business functionality after a disruption hinges greatly on the preparedness for and initial response to a disaster. When disasters strike, there is little time to put in place additional arrangements um, acquire new skills or the necessary resources and supplies. So preparing in advance allows for an adequate response to a disaster. And that's exactly what we're going to be covering with our three panellists today. And I'd really like to start with you, Kerry. I'll just quickly introduce you a little bit of background. Kerry Battersby is Project Manager at QFF and for the Farm Business Resilience Programme. And Kerry specialises in recovery, resilience and business continuity for farmers when confronted by drought and natural disasters and has worked, as she's mentioned, on projects for the production nursery industry management of QFF response to drought 
and the flood and the recent flood events in Queensland as well. So incredibly topical and very poignant. So it's great to have you, as I said, Kerry. Now, I just wanted to um, chat with you and ask you really the first question. How important are the first 36 hours of the initial response phase? Yeah, thanks, Sally. Look, this initial response phase after a disaster is so important mm. because farmers need to get back on their feet. They need to restore operations, production processes, but also ensure that safety is paramount on the site. So that any volunteers that come on site, even for you and your family and staff, especially, um, if they arrive for clean up, they really need to know what to do and they need to be organised. And it's usually the farmer's responsibility to do that. So this, this response in this first phase, this first 36 hours, this first three days is critical. So it's a time when you can see damage. Um, you might not be, get, be able to get onto every paddock, but you can sort of give a general damage assessment. And Lisa will talk about that later and how, um, how we've got a new way of, of managing that, that assessment. It's a time to take photos. And just assess the immediate critical issues. Are there fallen power lines? Are there chemical leaks? Um, is there catastrophic damage to any farm infrastructure? So it's these sort of critical issues can be done in, say, the first four to six hours. Um, mm -hmm. You might not be able to resolve them, but at least you can identify them. And then, you know, in that next two to three days, um, it's about identifying issues that prevent the farm from going back to business as usual or restoring the operations. So it you know, includes what damage has occurred to crops or livestock once you can get back into the paddocks, um, you know, identifying when is it safe for staff or just managers to return to the site. Um, and, and more importantly, you know, are local roads open to enable staff to actually get in and um, supplies to get deliveries in and out? So it's just critical in this initial 36 hours for each farmer um, to, to take stock of what has what the impact has done to the site. And you know, some people take it on with gusto, but then they might fall over, you know, after the event. Um, it will depend on how one experiences shock. So, you know, you've got to be aware that there's a mental health component to this first initial phase. So it's just so important that we recognize that. And um, it's okay to feel sick in the stomach when you see something like this, but mm. you get on and, and know that there is support there for you. Yeah, it's important um, because yeah, that's right, how you deal with shock. But I would imagine most importantly is being prepared. I mean, I can, you can probably never be completely prepared, but being as prepared as you possibly can is essential. Well, preparation is the key. Yep. So you think about this response phase as a circle, as a loop. So to achieve, say, an efficient response in those first hours or first days following a disaster, the work that you've actually put in in preparation with your farm site, your infrastructure and your staff will pay off during this initial phase. So mm -hmm. ideally, you'll have prepared your farm for any hazards during an off season. For example, you know, if you're in a bushfire zone, if you've used the, the wet season or the off season for bushfire to just check the perimeter, you know, can, can a fire truck get down there? Is it clear? Um, the, the basic stuff that all householders should do. Are gutters clear of any leaf litter? You know, have staff practiced an emergency evacuation in that off season? These are sort of some of the activities that can be done pre-season. Um, yeah. so, so, so preparation is the key for off season, but also the activities that can be done in say the days or even the hours leading up to, if we're using the example of a bushfire. Yes. Um, we tend to get plenty of warning of warning. high yeah. bushfire days, risk days, but you know, coming down to preparation, having a written plan is critical. And then sharing that plan, communicating that plan with those who, who need to know, like your staff, your key managers, um, mm. You know, that's that's important and getting these tasks written down so that they know what to do and they know what your response is going to be if there's a, you know, a bushfire situation. So it's really critical that your, you know, emergency procedures are practiced in the off season when you're not under this duress, um, but then having everything written down so that people know what to do and what to expect from you as well. 
Yeah, okay, so all those emergency um, numbers and, you know, all of that should be written down as well. And and then, like you said, you need to, you know, really do drills and uh, practice that off-season, but also in the moment you've got to make sure you're communicating with everyone in the in the few hours leading up, in the short term, the short time preparation. That period must be because you're experiencing, like we said before, emotionally, you'd be stressed and shocked and panicked, maybe a little bit panicked. Some people are better, some people aren't. But, you know, the more people are that, that you communicate with, the easier it's going to be to work together as a team to get everything done. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And if you've got all those tasks written down and yeah. you're, you know, if you hold a staff meeting three days before you're expecting something or the week of, um, you know, they know what to do. And so so a, a, a work in progress, a staff meeting, um, getting everyone involved in those preparation activities. And Barry can provide us with some examples um, here today about what, you know, what some of the production nurseries can do to prepare, because there's plenty of examples for cyclone and flood um, prep, preparation, um, which really helps in this initial response phase. And I guess there's that um, you probably need a plan for after, you know, when the event disaster is sort of at, at past its worst stage, at least, then what do you do then? Well, it's interesting because if you've got a plan and you're using your staff to actually prepare the site for impact, it's often useful to have those same staff undo what they've done in the in the, in the preparation so that Makes they sense. know where they have put the, the key to the um, key to the tractor they know how to start the generator they know where it's where the diesel's located to fuel the generator so and, and things like you know Barry will say you know moving stock to higher ground if you've got that same staff member doing the reverse after the event that's really helpful and it also gives them a, a purpose in mm. the in the in the storm so to speak yes exactly that and that's important that in itself is give me something to do I need Absolutely. to do absolutely. Yeah, I'd imagine yeah. that. Well, I, thank you very much, Kerry. I would like to bring in Barry Naylor now, Principal Queensland and Northern New South Wales Green Life Industry Australia. Just a little bit about Barry. Barry Naylor has been involved in the production nursery sector for over 40 years, owning his own nursery for more than 20 years, which is really quite incredible. He has been working for the state and national industry associations in many varied roles, including as the Queensland Industry Recovery Officer for the nursery industry for multiple disaster events. Barry, really good to have you on board. Can I just first ask you to just really just follow on from what Kerry and I have been discussing, how important is preparedness for nurseries to help them through the initial response phase and attain a a return to production as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, I I guess I can only reiterate what Kerry said that, you know, those that preparation is key is what Kerry said. Mm. And um, and that is absolutely the the way to describe it. Anyone that is prepared, usually they are the ones that fare the best. And, um, you know, what we, I guess we're encouraging them to do what we would consider in many instances to be quite simple um, things that are not simple in a state of shock. Um, but if you're prepared, um, things like, um, you know, having your generator, you know, having a plan for, for power in the average nursery is key because plants need water. And so if people have planned, um, planned, I guess, an irrigation plan, because even, even those that are, and perhaps a really good example is during the monsoon event around Townsville, in spite of having all those days of rain, because we grow in containers, believe it or not, those plants needed water the next day in spite of how much they might have received as opposed to a paddock that once waterlogged you know there might be several weeks before you can get back on it in a nursery sense those plants believe it or not need water the next day so drying away Mm. yeah so part of their planning would be um might be irrigation to wash off you know some silt from a flooding event or it might be um, that the plant just simply needs water to survive so it's you know preparation is key you've got to have all those things and I guess it extends maybe into the more preparing for a cyclone. It's things like having, um, they have protected cropping. So they have covers over a lot of plants. Sometimes it's an impervious cover. Sometimes it's a shade cloth or a hail net. We, we tried to encourage over the time for people that knew that they were in those sort of high risk zones to have covers, particularly for their high risk plants. So plants that they might need to help them in their recovery process, perhaps they needed to have a spare cover um, on hand for those particular houses 
it meant that, the, you know, I guess you'd call them, for, for those that are uninitiated, the little babies, they yeah. might need protection from the sun immediately the next day. So is there something that I can pull up over them to protect them? Um, protecting that starter stock is a, is a, is a critical area um, of concern and risk for the average production nursery. And then if we think about, I guess, a flow and effect, it's things like having enough fungicide, because I can guarantee to you after 14 or 12 days of rain that they received in the Townsville area or the rain that you received from a cyclone, something as simple as do I have enough fungicide becomes important. And like I, I guess repeating what Kerry said, um, discussing the plan in advance more broadly as a team, that's a, that's a key aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm, absolutely. Can you give us some really good examples of businesses returning to production really quickly, just from how they were prepared so well? Well, I can't give you any um, examples of someone returning really quickly, but what I can say is those that um, are prepared in any way, shape or form do recover quicker than those that don't. So those that have a, a comprehensive plan obviously recover very um, quicker than they might. Those that do something are better than those that do nothing. Um, the, the, as Kerry, I think, um, alluded to, the shock, that is considerably lessened by those that basically are, right, we're into our plan, what do we do here? You know, that they, they're, you take them out of that shock, they're jolted out of the shock, because, oh, hang on, we've got a plan here, we know what we're going to do. They've actually talked about their plan just prior to the event. They were just about to have this incident in, in the case of flood and um, and um, and cyclone, they've been prepared, they've seen the mapping, we could have this, they're prepared. The shock is less because they all know what they're going to do. Um, and I, as I reiterated about the, the small stock, those junior plants, the babies, those that have protected those that might have lost some more adult um, stock during an event are able to then bring those into a production system and then and they recover the, they recover the best. And that um, Kerry mentioned that those that have moved stock, either to higher ground or a highly protected area can usually um, protect that from the worst of the event. And then they're ready virtually the next day to do something yeah. about maintaining their stock level going forward. Yeah. So you can sort of get back on board a lot quickly that way. So back to business as usual, you know, and that's what this is all about, having a plan so you can get back to business as usual, as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and as safely as possible because that's the other thing we need to think about as well. Okay, so communication amongst, we're just reiterating the same again, and please feel free to jump in, Kerry, if you'd like to here, but obviously communication with everybody and also what your surrounding neighbours, let other people know what's going on as well, I would imagine, spreading the word. Yeah, I might just jump in, Sally. So, yeah, absolutely, communication is the key in this one, and I think that's a common theme for this QFF Farm Business Hour um, series. Uh, yes. Communication is paramount with your suppliers, with your clients, and with your team. Um, you know, simple things like picking up the phone and telling telling your client um, that you know you're about to be impacted by something you're expecting. You know, a Category Three cyclone. They'll have seen it on the news, but they might not necessarily know that you're located in its um, yes. projected path. Just let them know. Um, it's a courtesy call. Um, same with any suppliers. I mean, if you've got truckies and you're expecting deliveries of um, inputs at any time when you're expecting this, this event to, to impact, it's just, again, it's courtesy. Make sure they're, they're not stuck somewhere on the Bruce Highway in flood water. Um, it's for their safety as well. But also, you know, just, just to ensure that, you know, you're not getting a, a delivery of um, growing media halfway through a, through a flood event or a cyclone. So it, those courtesy calls can make a huge difference to lives, but also your planning. So um, your clients aren't then ringing you up the next week saying, where's my stock? Mm -hmm. And then you've got to double back and go through again and relive the event by telling them. Um, so, so that preparation, the communication is key. And, and you know, as, as Barry said, you can have um, compounding events you can have you can have a cyclone that comes through rips the shade cloth off and then you've got um scorching right. temperatures for, for for three days afterwards you've got a compound of sunburn potentially on crop so not only are you impacted by cyclone you've then got sunburn crop if you know that can't be sold mm -hmm. um so you've got a you know the the impact can be devastating um on the business and on the on the human being that's going through it, 
but the preparation and the communication is key. So, and there are a heap of resources for each of the industries available. And that's part of what the Farm Business Resilience Program is all about as well. It's about helping farmers to better prepare for impacts, but also, you know, from a business continuity perspective, which is my passion, um, to let people, you know, help them plan for those sorts of business interruptions. Yeah, well, it's reducing risk and, um, you know, and hopefully less loss at the at the end of the day. It's managing the loss. Mm, mm, managing the loss. So, Barry, how long can it take for a nursery to, you know, get back to business as usual? Yeah, well, I suppose that's a, you know, it's a, a variable uh, response. And certainly I would add by at the beginning that those that are prepared uh, usually recover quicker. But if I had to put a, a middle point on it, it's probably around 18 months. And the reason for that is that it usually takes a full production cycle, which for many people is a year. So they might spend um, you know, a month to three months getting their physical um, facility back to scratch. But as far as the stock being replaced it, uh, around a year, so that gives them a, a net result of about 18 months. Those that are really quick, it's probably in the six to 12 month range, um, but we would have uh, businesses that grow larger stock uh, full recovery, three years. Okay. Well, that's, good. that's definitely a, a good guide for everyone who's listening here. And, I mean, we've talked a fair bit about communication. Communication is super important, obviously, when an event is imminent and and also immediately after. It's mm -hmm. key, isn't it? Yeah. You know, like we, we, we encourage people, you know, like they're the kind of two things that you're going to hear over and over and over, preparation and communication. When it comes to communication, you know, it's everything about team, you know, the team, you know, your 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 work team, um, that, that that they've discussed the plan before, um, particularly their welfare, even if it's before an event. I think making sure that everyone's actually going to be okay, um, even something as simple as getting an accurate weather forecast, you know, and where that you know particular cyclone path might be going to to go. Just simple communication methods sometimes, um, you know, uh, um, are important. And as we say, know your, know your role. So your staff know their role well before the event. Um, and so that, that when it happens, that it's, you know, it's pretty clear for them. You know, so then I suppose as an after, a communication after the event, you're going to hear a little bit about that from um, Lisa and the government uh, perspective later, later about filling in a form, you know, so that you can say what is actually the impact in your particular uh, case. Again, communicating with the team member, team member group and your helpers. Um, and I think the thing is, amongst all of this, is showing that someone cares. You really can't have enough uh, contact from people that are just, you know, checking in to say that you care because you'll hear it from other people uh, during um, um, the presentation that mental health is a big deal. And uh, just having contact with other people that have either experienced loss before um, or uh, and know how to handle and to say it'll be okay, step by step, you will get over this. And just knowing you're not alone mm. through yep. something like this would be so important, Barry. When you show up as a recovery officer, you know, you're there's a pseudo mental health, you know, um, first aid kind of role that you play. And in fact, we've done that before for various events because you learn very quickly that those first few people that make contact with someone post-disaster are very important. And like you say, just knowing that someone is there, someone cares, someone listens, someone can say, I've seen people with this before, you will get through it, um, does your little bit. You're hardly a mental health professional, um, but you can do your bit. Mm, very important. And like you said too, just reiterating, as far as communication and being prepared with a plan and obviously training your staff, we haven't really talked too much about that, but I think the most important thing is that staff really understand what their job role is going to be and, um, as we said, communicate together at the time, but but they know what they're doing. Every person has a job to do and they're well aware of it and they can also be aware of what everyone else is doing as well just in case someone else needs to, to fill in for someone because, you know, something's happened to them, for example. Yeah, and we would encourage, mm -hmm. like you say, Sally, that, you know, people know their role. Um, yeah. We do encourage businesses to cross-train um, because... Mm -hmm. You never know whether that, you know, person C is the person that knows how to do these roles. Well, they're the one that can't get there because of um, access, as Kerry's alluded to. So know your role, do a bit of cross-training and certainly spread the load. Um, don't try and take it all on yourself as the owner, manager, you know, key supervisor. If there are, you know, if there are 20 team members and 12 of them can get there, it's 
12 of them have got a, you know, a range of jobs to do, spread the load, um, spread the load out. Yeah, very, very important. No time to be, you know, the one that does, I'm the person that does yeah. it all or feel like you're the one in control. <laughs> it's no time for that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. I think it's time we brought Lisa into the conversation. She's been waiting very patiently there, but oh, um, we do want to. We want to talk about obviously the response to it as well. But I'll just do a little lead in before I I bring you in, Lisa. Um, the response function of emergency management includes actions to limit injuries, as we've discussed, loss of life, property damage, and the environment. And these actions can happen before, during and immediately after the disaster event. And this is the most complex of the emergency management functions taking place under pressure and stress, often with limited information and the resource and resources and the requirements for saving and sustaining lives and preventing property and environmental damage. As we've mentioned, they're really diverse and the subsequent disaster recovery phase can provide a unique opportunity to rebuild a stronger and more resilient response to future events. Data collection, activation of disaster recovery assistance and communication of advice or warnings is instrumental for effective disaster management and response. And one such data collection tool that is currently being implemented by the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries is the Disaster Impact Survey. And this is what we're really going to talk about with Lisa. And to provide us with all the information about the function of this um, survey and uh, provide a brief demonstration, which would be great to have on screen of the Disaster Impact Survey. Lisa is going to take us through it. Before I bring Lisa in, I do want to just tell you a little bit more about what she, she does. As you know, she's the Acting Director for the Disaster Response at DAF, and her focus is on how to better assist farmers to prepare for and recover from disaster events and as I mentioned, Lisa actively works with producers, industry groups and government at all levels to find better and easier and faster ways to support the agriculture sector. Lisa, finally, it's time to chat. <laughs> it's good to have you with us. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, look, it's, it's my pleasure in, indeed. Um, thank you very much for, for having me here. And, and there were times there I thought, oh, I'd love to jump in. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, the key themes here are preparedness, uh, communication um, you know, across all areas in, in which we work. And, and that's that's no different um, for, for how I work in government and, as you highlighted, working with industry and, and producers. So from a communication perspective and just talking about the before we enter um, a, a disaster phase where we'd be looking to use a disaster impact survey, uh, from a government perspective, we talk to um, Kerry, yourself, uh, um, other representatives from QFF and, and across your um, peak body and other peak bodies, depending on which industries may be affected by an event. And we, we do that by organising uh, a, a uh, online uh, conference to talk about the um, projected impacts of a disaster event and what are the key things that we need to look out for, which um, areas are, are likely to be, the, be in the path of, of that disaster. And it's an opportunity to share in, in intelligence between uh, what, what we're able to obtain um, through a government perspective and also um, from an industry perspective perspective so that together we can look to um, have some visibility of any potential issues that might crop up um, and most importantly how together and that's the, the key here how together um, industry and government can work through issues to resolve them on the fly so often in an event especially a large one we will look to hold those meetings as often as we need to so that may be once or twice per day to address those those issues as, as we go through. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So just um, in, in terms of the disaster impacts um, survey, just a, a, a brief um, background um, for, for that. Um, so that the survey itself um, originally started out as paper-based, um, as with the evolution of most uh, things with technology as we've moved ahead that moved into the digital world. Uh, it had a lot of um, support from industry. Kerry, I'm looking straight at you. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> A lot, of, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of feedback was was taken on board, and that and that was from QFF extension officers as well to to advise us of what's working and what's not working. We moved to an iPad collection um, version where we would have DAF um, extension officers and and also um, QFF officers on ground. Uh, usually immediately after, so in that recovery phase, to come and do face to face. Uh, assessments, record those details in the in the iPad, and that would be um, up, uploaded either into your Q, um, QFF database uh, or into the the DAF departmental uh, database to record the the impacts. So where we've moved to from there is into the disaster impact survey that um, is in the cloud, as lots of things are in the in the cloud these days, and we're moving to a single source of well, basically the, a single collection funnel of information that pertains to the 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 impacts or the or the the, the issues that you've experienced on farm on your property so we're looking to record what's actually happened um, and it's an it's evidence based so i think most producers would be aware that there that uh, under certain conditions there and circumstances, there, there are high levels of assistance available through the jointly funded disaster um, recovery funding arrangements with the Commonwealth. So what we look to do is encourage uh, as much producer input as we can to the survey. And I'm really building the moment here, Sally, uh, before I demonstrate the, the, the survey itself. It, it is relatively quick and easy to use, but we've tried to keep the fields quite limited to be flexible, but be limited because we we understand that at the time that you're inputting impacts, uh, serious impacts to your farm, the last thing you really feel like doing is filling out a survey, okay? Yeah. So we're trying to keep it simple to the point that it's meaningful and that any stage, um, you can come back to your survey once it's been submitted and you can update details. So as impacts become clearer, so if it's a flooding event um, and the, the, the water goes down and, and you can start to see those plants that have, that have been impacted and how they actually look, you can upload with photographic evidence as well. So you can come back any number of times to update that information. Mm-hmm. Has anyone got any questions for me at the at the moment um, before we head over to the survey, or will I just? Um, I just, end think, the I just wanted to add here, um, Lisa. This is such a great tool for farmers. What a what a fantastic resource for them. To well, have. look, I, look, I think so, and and also for industry groups, and I, I will come to this. But for you mm. as industry people as well, that the, your data um, it will come to what we use your, your data for, but. There, it paints a picture essentially of where those impacts are, the, the industries that affect are affected, and um, the severity of the of the impacts. Uh, I, I'm, as a as a human being, I'm incredibly passionate about what this survey um, can do to to help producers, uh, help you recover, um, and and also is, help you prepare. As well. Well, it, it helps you prepare, and, and if you, you you know that the survey is available, that it doesn't change from one event to another. So the 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 link to the survey that you've dropped in the chat mm-hmm. is the same link from one disaster event to the next. Now let's hope that we don't have successive disaster events like we've experienced uh, over the last twelve months. Certainly. But you can be sure from one year to the next that that survey link will remain the same. There may be improvements as we we move ahead with technology to make things even easier for you to to input. But there is that level of consistency. So uh, you know if you get if you receive the link through through QFF through your um, extension offices through DAF in the media, through social media, you can be assured that it's all going to take you to the one place. We do have some very old fashioned style. People may think that we're in this high tech age of uh, the way in which we we store information on the cloud, but we do have the good old fashioned fridge magnet as well. (laughs) 
can't for, beat for the good old fashioned fridge. Look, you can't. You can't. Great for hanging the kids' homework and all those important Absolutely. sorts of things. Absolutely. And it gets and uh, it's gonna get the most eyeballs too, really, let's face it. And that and that's the thing, you can't beat it. So if you put it somewhere where, where it's prominent and when you when you need it, when you are in need, it's right there ready for you to take that image on your iPhone and you can you can start doing your survey immediately from there. Okay. So how about I Let's have a look. share my my screen with you. So while Lisa's just setting that up, I'll just um make a comment about the, the great collaboration that's been happening between DAF, QFF and the, the, the member groups, all of the industry groups to um, make this happen. And as Barry will know, the amount of um, work and effort that each industry group goes through to get on the phone to those that they know are in the impacted areas um, to make those phone calls. Sometimes you can get through, sometimes you can't. But what we were finding was if we can um, pull this into one single resource, which is the um, disaster impact survey, it takes, um, it, it provides government with uh, an immediate access to the data, um, which comes in, as Lisa will explain, um, uh, in the days and the weeks following the impact. But from an industry perspective, um, we were finding that industry would, would contact growers, um, government would contact growers, and they were, they were potentially getting contacted by multiple groups asking, how are they? Which, which is okay, yeah. but you, if you're suffering the stress, um, it can be quite traumatic to relive it time and time again with different people who are ringing you up or visiting. So this gives an immediacy to it um, and it's a great collaboration. It doesn't take away from uh, uh, the, the all important phone call that industry can make, but it's, it's a resource there that can provide all of us with um, uh, key data on the impact. Mm -hmm. Very streamlined. Okay, Lisa, you're Thanks, going to take it. And any questions any of the way through this um, presentation, just, just stop me and I will be happy to explain it to you. So firstly, once you click into the survey, this is your, your um, very first screen that you will see. So it's a Queensland DAF Agricultural Disaster Survey, Impact Survey. Now, and it does have a disclaimer at the top of the screen that if you are in immediate danger, to contact Triple O. Uh, we're not a first response agency um, for, for human life. So we do have that disclaimer there. Um, and we'll talk about what we do uh, with your information here of, of how it's shared and how at every stage of completing this survey, when you get to the end of it, that, that you're in control of where your information goes. So I, I just want to make that point really, really clear. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Well, that's so, very important to know that because I'm sure people will want to know that, Lisa. Mm. Good, good, good. So... First of all, you just have some drop down boxes. What type of event is it? Because as we know, in Queensland, we can have, unfortunately, bushfires at, at, you know, at one end of the state and flooding and cyclones at the other. So we, this survey can cater for multiple events at the same time. So for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll just select that it's a flood. Uh, so once again, it'll ask if you're in, in, in imminent danger that, you know, you need to call triple O, but you do have the facility to say, do you need urgent assistance with food, fuel or livestock moment, uh, movements? Now, this particular field, because we, we can change the, the fields a, as we need to, but this particular field was added uh, in response to the, the Northwest flooding event. Okay, where, where we've got uh, livestock um, producers that have been isolated on their properties. Uh, they've, it's fairly flat land in, in that area, so it, it was difficult to get um, stock to higher ground in, in quite a number of cases. So, and we had some uh, homesteads that, that were completely flooded, um, no generator uh, or, or electricity to the house, that sort of thing. So we were able to use this um, disaster impact survey as a, as a triaging service, if you like, so that it would um, throw out an alert to us here in DAF that we could refer uh, certain areas. So if there were biosecurity areas or that you needed assistance with food or fuel or, or livestock, 
that it would throw an alert to those particular um, areas within our department in DAF so that we could respond to those immediately, those immediate concerns. So moving um, along, it's, it's not a big deal for you know, the, the date and the time as such, but you can just click on whatever day it is that you're entering your survey, that's fine. It doesn't, don't have to worry too much about what the time is. Uh, now, this is where, how would you rate the impact to your property? So what I'm suggesting here is that it's, it's your best indication of how you, you think that your property has been impacted. So if you think it's only a minor impact, then you'd click on minor. If you thought it was moderate or major or catastrophic, you'd click on the, the corresponding box. Now, once again, you may think at a particular point in time when you per first put your survey in that you may have catastrophic impacts. As the days go by um, post incident, you may think that perhaps it's not as bad as you first thought. You can go back into your survey and you may reduce that back to, to major or moderate. Likewise, if, if you thought that there were minor impacts, you've always got the ability to change that. It's your best estimation at the time. So moving along, uh, is there a biosecurity, um, welfare or environmental risk? Um, so that, you know, that's um, for, you know, plants or animals, uh, either or either um, for those. And that's a yes, no, or whether you're uncertain. Now you could put in what you think that that, and there may be an animal welfare um, risk, there may be uh, other biosecurity risks, whether they're plant or animal biosecurity or environmental risks. So you can, that's a free text area that you can enter in details. Okay. Yeah. With the location of the property, uh, you've got an option where you can just simply type in your current address or uh, you can drop a pin on the map if you're that way inclined. So for the, the sake of this exercise, I'll just drop in Caboolture and you'll see, you'll see how quickly it brings up the, the, the map and it drops a pin on your location. Moving along to the activity or the industry at the location, this is specifically about your farm. Uh, so you've got a number of different um, industries that you can select here. So I'll just run through them. Like we've, it's not an exhaustive list, but we've tried to capture the major areas. So we have cropping, horticulture, nursery, livestock, uh, forestry, and fisheries as well. So for the sake of this, exercise, I'm going to select the nursery sector. Now, you may, you may be uh, having other, you may also have other industries um, on your uh, property. So you may or may not. If you don't, you, then you can continue on to the next um, drop down box. But I'm just going to select horticulture. Let's say you, you had another um, another horticulture industry and you can nominate which crop that might be and we might say that it's lifestyle vegetables. So as we move through, it will start to ask you more detailed questions um, about uh, the types of impacts. So are your crops, horticulture, pasture or, or pasture or forestry affected by this event? So in which case, yes, they are. And here's where you estimate uh, the, the area of dis destroyed or damaged uh, crops or pasture or forestry in hectares. So you might estimate that you've got 10 hectares uh, that are damaged. Once again, it's your best estimation for the cost um, of the, the damage that you see at that point in time that you're entering your survey. So at which point we will select between 500 and a thousand and a million dollars damage. And again, you know, uh, on reflection, you might decide to go in and change that once you learn more or it might need to change. Most definitely. There's certainly that flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got an option here, are livestock um, or 
aquaculture, tongue twister, uh, affected. So I'm going to put yes. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going for not a great outcome here, but I, I'm doing that so that you can see the number of fields and options. If you if you need to select them, they are there. So I'm going to indicate that there were uh, five um, dead head of stock um, and I've got 25 missing. Um, I don't have aquaculture on my property. So I'm just going to bypass those. You also are able to enter damage to infrastructure. So I'm going to, I know that I've got some impacts because I've got some shedding that's been damaged. So here's where you can click on you know, equipment, whether you have fences or gates that you know are down, uh, machinery that's been submerged by this particular flooding event. Um, you may have um, water in infrastructure. Uh, if you have, um, as you were you were saying, Barry, earlier about the irrigation and the need for those seedlings to have water uh, straight up the next day, even at that time for the flooding event in Townsville, the monsoon event where <laughs> there was that much water around except where you needed it. Or you may have fodder. So you can select as many or as little of these that may apply to your property. You can select, you can type in how many kilometres of fencing are impacted. So I'm going for 45. Private roads might be a mess. So you can put in how many kilometres. Um, Levy channels that might be impacted. So you can you type in your what your best estimate there is. And the infrastructure impacts of what you think that the cost to repair or replace that may be. And here's an important one, which is how long do you think that the property, your farm will take to recover to normal production levels? So it may be something that you feel is six to 12 months to recover from this event, or you've got the option, if it's a, a, a catastrophic event, that that may look like something that's more around uh, the two year mark for you to recover. If you have any other additional details that you'd like to give about what's happened on, on your farm, you know, it, it may be that you know of other growers um, that are affected that are, are near you. That's something that you can also type in there or any other details for, that you may like to provide us with remembering that we will be able to, with your permission, we will be able to share this information, this survey um, with um, your industry group. What, so, if there, what if there's injury to, to staff members and things, does that apply or this is purely just, is that not relevant or? Not particularly for, for the purpose of this mm. survey. One of those personal because we, yeah, we're not really a first risk, we're not a first response mm -hmm. agency as in the, the police and fireys and, and AMBOs. Uh, so we're, we're primarily doing dealing with agriculture. However, if this is the only avenue open to, to, to you as a producer to alert us to that, certainly we, we will triage that, but just making it clear we, we're not a first response agency, yeah. um, Sally. So if you're, you're doing a survey by your phone or your iPad and you're looking out at your, your property and your flooded paddocks, for example, then you can take the photo instantly and you'll be prompted to take the photo and it will ask you, do you want to upload this image to your file? So I won't sit here and take a photo of myself sitting in front of the screen, but if you have the photo saved in your phone or on your device, you can also um, drag and drop them through the normal means um, into this space. So you can, you can put in up to 10 photos there so that's 10 photos per survey, but once you have uploaded your, your, your initial survey and you want to go back in and upload additional photos or provide additional information, you can add another 10 photos in on top of that. So there is that capacity to expand the amount of images that you put in against your survey. We will ask you a question around, can we use your photographs in the media? So for instance, we would never share any images from your property without your permission. We would never 
even with your permission to share those um, photos um, to, to media and social media, if they included um, imagery of uh, people uh, in those photos, even though you'd, you'd said we can share them, we still would not share those because they have images of people in them. So you've got the option to say yes or no there. You've also got the option uh, to select, would you like to be contacted um, by your industry group? So you can click yes. Now, one, one of the, it, it, it sounds simple, but one of the, one of the things that, um, that we had here, just, just I, I digress, was that you, we had the ability as a new feature to select your industry group to send your report to or indicate that you would like a follow-up call or email from your industry group. And we had it said that you could select one. Now, because we've worked so closely with, with uh, QFF and, and AgForce and, and others, Kerry said to us, Lisa, what would be really good is if we could select yes, QFF, but what if, what if a producer is also a member of Growcom? and they're also a member of the nursery and garden industry of Queensland, you'd want to be able to let those in, in, all of those industry groups know. So that was as simple, <laughs> but it, it, that's where it's always good to have a, another set of eyes mm. uh, to let us know that, yes, that it is important to be able to send the survey, if you want, to other industry groups that you may belong to. You can also select whether you would like to, uh, to receive an, an email copy of your responses. Mm. Now, it's important to note that by submitting a survey, it doesn't constitute um, an application for, for disaster assistance, okay? This is our primary evidence collecting tool in order for the department to build that case uh, for higher levels of activation, as in um, disaster recovery funding. So by selecting this button, it the survey will automatically provide you with a copy of your report that you've submitted, complete with all your attached photographs. And here's where you can select, yes, I'd, I'd like my industry group to receive a copy of my email. And as we saw, you've selected three industry groups that you would like your report to go to. So here's where you would enter your email address and simply submit by pressing the submit button. It's that easy. Mm. It's, that, it's that easy to do. So are there any questions on the survey itself at this point? Well, there is a question from Claire, um, and I'll just read it out as, it, as she's written it. Can you speak to the, to the speed with which urgent assistance notifications from the survey are disseminated through your department? Example, outside business hours? Yes, yes, I, I, can, I can confirm that. That um, we, we operate within the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries in a response um, we, we in, a, in a mode with that people may be familiar with uh, with the State Disaster Coordination Centre. You might be familiar with the way the, the, the police operate in, in, in disasters and emergency situations. And the, de the Department of Agriculture, even though we're not a first response agency, we operate in a very much a, this, a similar operating structure to that. So that being the case, it means it, it triggers a particular uh, response structure within our department and it triggers certain uh, factors where we monitor uh, email traffic uh, very closely overnight. Um, we have our, our survey is activated, it is always on, it is on 365 days a year. And we have actively have people that, that monitor um, those surveys and triage the inquiries if there's biosecurity concerns. Naturally, we wouldn't be able to attend to it during the night, but I can assure you that that, that is something that is managed the next day immediately. Um, if there, and as, as and where those concerns uh, come through, and they are also, uh, those issues pertaining to, to producers and industry are also things that are shared in our industry 
meetings that we have during those response events. So once again, that's that two-way street, the two-way communication flow between government and industry because it, it, working as a partnership gets results. Um, does that help answer your question, Claire? Brilliant. Thanks for the clarity she has just said. So that's great. Thanks, Claire, for the question. Um, Thank you. Barry, did you want to jump in at all and comment on this and your thoughts at this stage or some feedback from existing clients? Um, well, no, the only thing I'd say, and perhaps Kerry already might even be aware of what I'm about to say, is that they might they 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 might be able to put their protected cropping as a you know that's the main thing they lose is structures so that they can put that under infrastructure loss and the other main loss that people have is um i guess it's stock so that they need to see a generalized word that they get under stock because if they see it as live stock they yeah. won't get it they'll think that's a moo moo and uh, perhaps not applicable to me um, and I'm more than happy to provide um, um, feedback on what is in that uh, survey in that context so that I know they've really got inputs, their business inputs, you know, pots, fertiliser, growing media, it gets washed away or blown away um, and uh, structures and then also the, the finished stock. Well, that's, that's wonderful um, feedback for me and it only enhances uh, this, the survey to, to make it even even better. And, and this goes to the heart of communication. So you know, yes. without us all being a, a part of this, this panel today at to, and talking to your um, pr producer body, then we wouldn't know, would we? So that's, thank you, Barry. Yeah, and that, that's really good feedback. Um, yeah. yeah. Really good feedback, Barry, because you can see how even, um, you know, Lisa and her team have adjusted it only recently in response to the northern Queensland flooding by adding in that, that section about do, do you need food and fuel? So while mm -hmm. they might not be the first responders, this information is fed up through the government agencies to ensure that the helicopters arrived, that they were ready to go and that the response was um, was as efficient as it could be. So again, you got the preparation as the key. So um, yeah, thanks, Lisa. That's that's fabulous. And I imagine I imagine Kerry it'll just keep evolving and, and Lisa won't it, you know, this is the survey as it is today, but it, yeah, you just it'll just keep getting better and probably even more efficient. Well, yeah. Oh, look, I, I believe so. Uh, I can, I'm happy to, uh, what I'd like to do next is to show you where does this information go? Where does my information end up? Mm. Um, okay. All right. But, uh, we've got, look, we've got a couple of minutes for that, Lisa, so let's jump into that now. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Okay. So this is a, the DAP disaster, industry disaster impact dashboard. Okay. So this is is something that's a, a work in progress, as Kerry will well know, uh, that we are trying to, to provide uh, meaningful data that's collected um, as a result of your surveys, but maintaining your privacy as well uh, in a dashboard that's interactive, okay? So this is where, I can just zoom out, this is showing multiple events and multiple impacts as um, points, and these purple uh, lines here are the local government boundaries, um, just fear information. But what starts to happen in a disaster event when, when, there's, when there's the impacts put into the survey, it automatically populates into this dashboard. So I, I don't wanna set anyone cross-eyed here when I zoom in, <laughs> but as you can see here, at the closer we get in, the, the more granular the detail becomes. So these larger dots with numbers in them, that indicates in those areas, there's three surveys sitting behind that. So we can keep zooming in closer and closer and closer to see uh, what level of impacts and what industry uh, you know, was, was impacted, the main industry, that sort of thing. Uh, overall, how many uh, kilometres of fencing have been damaged and that sort of thing. So the, the purpose of this is, and, and we will continue to, to work with you uh, in, in your um, respective industry groups on how you can best use this, this information and, and what works for you. 
But this is something that's live that will be av available to your um, industry groups 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, okay? And mm -hmm. it's a really, really powerful tool because it will show um, patterns um, not only within a, a, a one particular event that you may be experiencing at a particular point in time, but you'll have the your industry groups will have that historical data, so it yeah. will start to paint a very telling picture of of um, impacts over um, a number of years as well, and mm -hmm. the types of industries that have been impacted. That is absolutely vital. So um, I hope that uh, yeah, I'm sending you cross side again, but we are very exclusive. This is only for Queensland, um, but. I hope that gives you, you know, some some idea of, of where your um, data actually ends up. Yes, it sits um, within uh, the, the Queensland government and, and the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, but there, there's there's a bigger picture here, that, and there is a, 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 a honestly a um, a strong focus on how can we actually um, look after our producers. Um, together, um, hence the development of the, the the dashboard for industry to, to help you with as well. That's brilliant. Well, I wish we had some more time to speak a little bit more, but we've run out of time, Lisa. And Sorry. I that's fine. No, no, there's so much to talk about and cover, but um, I just wanted to quickly close by quickly asking Barry and Kerry and yourself just a really, uh, just one takeaway from each of you really quickly, if I could. Okay, Barry? So, yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll lead off and this is going to sound like a broken record, but prepare. Those that prepare certainly do best in these kind of uh, situations. So yes. the reason it's oft repeated is it's the truth. If you're prepared, you are, you put yourself in the best position to be able to recover quickly and to get on with life. And um, number two would be um, seek and accept help when it's offered. Great, great. Both of them, love them both. Thank you. And Kerry? Communication. Yes. One word. One word, Lisa? I'm, I'm going with Kerry. Communication, 100%. And All three right. additional words, disaster impact survey. There it is. <laughs> well, thank you um, to all of you. It's been riveting. Um, just quickly in closing, our next Business Hour episode is on the 31st of May. And we're looking at um, managing financial and market risks with our panellists, Daniel Elder, Jonathan Barrett and Susan Bryant. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on the 31st of May. Thanks again to our panellists. Mm -hmm.